Welcome to our battlefield tour of Manassas, a 5,000 acre national park where not one but two Civil War battles were fought. If you watched our war game a couple weeks ago, then you know today we're going to explore the sites of the first battle of Manassas. I'm Greg, I worked for the Park Service at Gettysburg Battlefield years ago and today I am joined by Tony. And I think a good way for Tony and I to handle today's tour would be for us to pick a few of our favorite human interest stories from the Battle of First Manassas. There are some exceptionally famous monuments at this park, like Stonewall Jackson's statue, but today I suggest we explore some of the lesser known, equally fascinating stories of the first great battle of the American Civil War. Great idea, Greg, but I think before we wander around the park, that this is a great spot to start our tour. Wouldn't the visitor center be a better spot? Well, we're not actually that far from the visitor center. Right now, we're standing at the stone house, which is conveniently located in the middle of the battlefield. From here, you can orient yourself and see how the action unfolded. We're standing along the Warrington Turnpike, and to our east is the stone bridge across Bull Run Creek. That represents essentially the northern edge of the Confederate lines. North of our position would be Sudley Springs Ford, where McDowell personally led his main column to outflank the Rebel line. And just to our south would be Henry Hill, where the Confederates withdrew midway through the battle, preparing to make their final stand. Just across the road, that gentle rise is Henry Hill, the spot where Thomas Jackson's brigade stood like a stone wall. Greg, where would you like to start this tour? Well, uh, if I'm picking our first stop today, I think we might as well go where the fighting began the Stone Bridge. While McDowell led his flanking force to turn the Rebel line, he left his largest division, Tyler's 8,000 men, to probe the Stone Bridge. The bridge was defended by just 1,000 Confederate troops under General Nathan Evans. The bridge you see here today is not the original. It was built 20 years after the war and designed to look like the original bridge. The original Stone Bridge was destroyed in the aftermath of the fighting here, left in ruins. On the morning of July 21st, 1861, the bridge was standing and it represented the best crossing point over the shallow, meandering Bull Run Creek. I do think it's worth asking, Greg, how did 1,000 Confederates hold off 8,000 Federal troops? Yeah, uh, that is quite the achievement and it is one due almost entirely to one man, General Nathaniel Shanks Evans. Just look at this guy. If you think he looks like a hard-drinking maniac, well, you'd be right. Colonel Evans kept his men well concealed along the thicket of the Bull Run, skirmishing with the Federals and refusing to reveal his full strength. Now, General Tyler could have sent his 8,000 troops across this creek. He could have, in hindsight. But remember, Tyler's orders were not to act as the main attack, and Evans was putting up a steady resistance utilizing the natural cover. The main reason I want to talk about Evans isn't just his clever patient tactics. He helped to make history at this spot. In the mid-morning, Evans received the first signal flag message ever used in combat. From about six miles away, Edward Porter Alexander observed McDowell's columns advancing from Sudley Springs and waved a signal flag to Evans to alert him. The message read, look out for your left, your position is turned. This was the first time a long range signal flag had ever been used in battle, and it worked. Evans redeployed his men just in time. Evans' small command couldn't possibly stop McDowell's flanking force, and eventually the Confederate line is pushed past Matthews Hill to Henry Hill, and I think that should be our next stop. General Joseph E. Johnston sent two of his brigades to reinforce the Confederate flank at Henry Hill, one under Bernard B. and one under Thomas Jackson. For our next stop, we'll go to Henry Hill, where General B fought what was destined to be his one and only battle. B's orders on the morning of July 21st were to defend the Confederate left flank. It was expected that he would see little fighting as Beauregard and Johnson would be attacking on the right. The rebel battle plan called for an offensive further down the Bull Run and Bernard B was discouraged that he would miss all the glory of the day. His fears turned out to be most unwarranted. That morning, B's brigade was posted in support of Nathan Evans. And interestingly enough, B had been the best man in Evans' wedding just a few years before the war. That's right, they had actually been classmates at West Point. Evans didn't get to fight in the Mexican-American War, but B did and served with distinction. 
B was given command of his brigade just four days before the battle, and he mounted an aggressive active defense against the main federal attack. We're standing on the very spot where General B was shot. He was hit in the stomach, it was a lingering death, he expired the next day. But what's most interesting about his legacy were the words he shouted. The famous line, there stands Jackson like a stone wall, rally behind the Virginians. And while it was widely regarded as a compliment of General Jackson's ability, at least one Confederate staff officer suggested that it was voiced as an insult. There are those who believe B was angry at Jackson for failing to advance in support sooner. And this theory suggests B's famous line was actually insulting Jackson for standing like a stone wall instead of bringing his men forward as the Yankees broke through. Of course, B died without leaving any account of the battle, so we'll never know for certain whether he meant that as an insult or a compliment. What we do know is that the Virginia papers latched onto that and the legend grew of the fallen hero complimenting the rising star. I think for our third and final stop on this tour, we should talk about two civilian heroes. And much like Bernard B's compliment to Jackson, theirs is also a story of some uh, historical controversy. We're going to head up to Sudley Springs, where McDowell crossed with his main force to attack the Confederate line in the morning. But the story we're going to tell is from much later in the day, after the battle had ended in Union retreat and disaster. Behind us is Sudley Springs Church, and like the Stone Bridge, it was also destroyed during the battle. At the time of the fighting, it was being used as a field hospital, and somewhere laying in the grass outside of this church was a 21-year-old private from New Hampshire, John Lovell Rice. Remember, this battle was fought on a Sunday, and if you can believe it, local civilians still went to church that day, despite the battle raging around them. That morning, Amos and Margaret Benson passed federal troops on the road. By the time they were on their way back home, they found Private Rice lying on his own, left to die with a wound to the lung. After the battle, when Amos and his wife found a Confederate doctor, the doctor confirmed for them that this young man was beyond medical assistance. In fact, he couldn't even be moved. And that's where most people would have left it. The Bensons were not most people. They came back for that young man, and they erected a small tent around him to shelter him from the elements. Then, for a week, they brought him their own food and medicine, until he was well enough to be taken down to the main Confederate field hospital at Manassas. You'd think from that that these people were federal sympathizers, at least. And you would think that, and you would be very wrong. <laughs> because not long after that, Amos enlisted in the Confederate cavalry, and his wife Margaret was an unreconstructed rebel for most of her life. Rice survived his wounds and was swapped in a prisoner exchange. He eventually rose to be a lieutenant colonel. Twenty years after the war ended, Rice happened to be on a trip to Washington, D.C., when he decided to come back to the battlefield to see if maybe he could find the Bensons. And sure enough, he did. Rice asked if there was any way he could repay their kindness, and eventually Amos told him that they were still about $200 short to rebuild the church after the devastation of the war. If Rice could chip in a few dollars, they would be grateful. Rice did more than that. He returned to Massachusetts and published an editorial in the Springfield Republican. Within a week, he raised $235, with many donations coming from Yankee veterans. The story became a national sensation, and it was lauded as an example of post-war reconciliation. Greg, why do I get the feeling that there's a but to that story? Eh, uh, but. Historians have questioned the accuracy of John Rice's account. There's no corroborating evidence about the week that he supposedly spent under that homemade tent that the Bensons erected around him. So what did happen during that week? Well, we're not entirely sure what happened, but historians have confirmed that after the battle, Rice did meet the Bensons, and he received some kind of medical attention from them. It's just he probably dramatized a lot of the details for his newspaper account. Thanks for joining us on the Battlefield Walk today, and we hope you enjoyed a few of our favorite personal interest stories from First Manassas. And if you didn't see our First Manassas war game yet, check it out. I played as one of the two Confederate commanders. And in our game, Bernard B. survives the battle. Others did not. If you guys liked the tour, like the video, and subscribe to Little Wars TV. Do you have any favorite stories from the battle? If so, tell us about them in the comments below. We'll see you next week.